Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Rachel Gonzalez Hansen, and it is a privilege to serve as the Senior Vice President of Western Operations for the National Association of Community Health Centers. Thank you for joining us today. Before we begin the program, NACS leadership would like to say a few words. And at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce NACS President and CEO, Tom Ben Coverden. Tom? Rachel, um, thank you very much. And I would add to, uh, for those who don't know Rachel, uh, she ran a very effective health center program in Texas and served as a national uh, president uh, for the NACA organization. And uh, Rachel, your leadership over those all these years has been really incredible, and I thank you. Um, let me just uh, say that I would also like to say hello on behalf of our current uh, chair, a uh, woman who is uh, busy, I'm sorry, tied up in meetings with the government, Elaine Woodward, but who asked please to extend her greetings and thanks to all those on the phone call. Uh, I know we are all deeply, deeply concerned, and NAC has released a statement regarding the senseless and horrific killing of George Floyd. Uh, and I would like to call upon uh, our uh, our uh, executive vice president for communications and chief diversity officer, and long long time employee of the National Association of Community Health Centers, Claudia Gibson. Uh, Claudia, just to talk uh, a little bit about our response uh, to that, and then I will follow up talking about what we're doing to fight for additional funding. So uh, again, Claudia, we would be lost without you and your services. And I am introducing you, my dear. Thank you, Tom. And stop telling people how long I've been working uh, in the movement. <laughs> uh, just by way, uh, let me just say that um, we're all very, very, very moved and distressed. I've talked to many of you around the country, and I've been talking to staff of all races, colors, and creeds, and trying to give pers my perspective, and most importantly, listening to them, particularly our younger folks. I was born and raised in D.C. I'm a child of the 50s and 60s, and I witnessed all of the protests, and I was a part of a lot of the protests, et cetera. And as we speak, my daughter in Boston, I can't get in touch with her, but I think she's in the middle of a lot of the uh, peaceful pro uh, pro uh, protests right now. So I, I think uh, I heard, I've gotten a lot of feedback on the statement, and uh, we certainly at NAC recognize it's just a statement. So I wanted to just to, to relay to folks what I've said to staff and, and some of the members that have called me, and that is, uh, first of all, let's recognize that our model is a, a, a very good example of community uh, partnership, uh, but we do have a lot of work to go, ways to go, and a lot of work to do in that area. But I do think that we can be part of the change, uh, but change has to start at home. And uh, I've had a lot of conversations with our chair of the board, Lathan, over the last uh, week or two. And uh, even starting with our previous chair, uh, immediate past chair, uh, Jim Luisi, it's interesting, he did a lot of listening tours while he was in office. And we got a lot of feedback from the field uh, in the areas of, of um, NAC's own processes and structures and things. And so we're working on a lot of recommendations that came out of that that have to do with diversity, inclusivity, and that's not only with st NAC staff, but it's about leadership, and it's, and it's uh, also so about our membership, and uh, hopefully in the next few months you'll see some some forward movement on that. But I'd like to also challenge, and I don't know if they're board members on the call, but I'd like to challenge our board members as well. Their role in all of this, in terms of change, is to uh, to beef up their efforts in the communities and start with the local leaders. Um, our story is is perfect as an example of what's happening and what needs to be done. And I ask that uh, health centers and, and our primary care associations also look at their structures and, and their level of inclusivity and their processes to make sure that we are uh, attracting and making people feel comfortable with input from all types of people in terms of what we are doing, what we're not doing, and to make people feel welcome into our movement. Um, 
I can assure you that Lathrin is uh, uh, on top of things with us. She's been very encouraging with us. And we, too, at NAC, I want you to know we're going through a process. Uh, we're looking inward uh, in terms of our own policies, our staff. I think our staff right now, and I don't believe in just numbers, uh, our staff is very uh, balanced in terms of ethnicities uh, and race, uh, age, um, uh, gender, uh, sexual orientation, but that's not enough. We recognize that, and we're looking at ways we can strengthen our processes to make sure there's opportunities for more and more people, and particularly the younger staff that's coming in. So with that, um, I, I guess I want to just end it, Tom, by saying that uh, – we did these listening tours a year or so ago, but we are still open, very much open to suggestions from our primary care association partners, from our membership, from board members, staff at health centers, uh, leadership at health centers, on ways we can improve NAC to make more people feel comfortable, more inclusive with us. And it's going to be a challenge, of course, this year as we go into doing virtual conferences and things. But it, pre it presents opportunities. And um, I just think that uh, we're strong as an organization and as a movement, and I'm very proud to still be representing and working with all of you. And I want to thank you. F and hang in there. This is a tough time for all of us. Claudia, thank you um, so much and for your very valuable contribution ongoing, including your work with the press uh, at all levels with your staff mm -hmm. and Amy and key articles that you've gotten uh, talking about this. And Claudia, just building a little bit on one of the things we are stressing in a big way in advancing our own uh, uh, policy, public policy agenda, is what you said, Claudia, that health centers indeed, this whole movement was founded upon a solution during the civil rights movement. And it will let us never, never forget that. And we're talking certainly about the black population of America, but also the mm -hmm. migrant farm workers and, uh, and Latino populations. We're talking about the Asian populations currently working uh, mm -hmm. throughout the country and of course, Native Americans. So uh, we are very much uh, concerned in that. And I think holding it forward and, and people well outside of NAC have said that you are one of the the most successful programs in the nation that has ever been created. And maybe most importantly was how you have integrated and, and how you have involved uh, those most left out for, and forgotten, the vast majority being minorities, uh, to, to create a program and create it in a way starting with community boards and the patients themselves having a voice, recruiting people from the movement the recruiting uh, physicians uh, that are highly sensitive and themselves of color and, and, and having uh, the expertise and deep commitment to such that in dealing with any number of situations or disease, the school-based uh, programs or the HIV program, immunizations, behavioral health, now the senior programs, again, community health centers have led by involving everybody in setting priorities, in developing and shaping programs and implementing those programs, and you should never forget that. Again, those are other people in foundations, in the Congress, and a number of past presidents. And so, my friends, I see that going forward. It's not the only thing, but when people are looking at, okay, so now that we've all expressed concern, what is it that we're doing to make a difference, and how do we get people more involved uh, in the processes? And again, community health centers do that. Uh, on a very quick note, I would like to, on the funding, we continue to fight for you on the funding, including the discussion to implement much of what you're talking about today. Let me just say that we've currently managed to uh, produce about $6 billion in additional funding, and there's probably an additional 20 on top of that with the provider payment protection, et cetera, that is currently being looked at uh, to get uh, allocated. Uh, I think, as many of you know, in the current uh, legislation that the House passed, there's an additional $7.6 billion exclusively targeted uh, for community health centers uh, in, uh, in, uh, to expand uh, uh, the COVID testing um, and treatment uh, programs. 
Um, in addition to that, we are currently working and letters have been sent. Uh, you should have copies uh, in the mail uh, about the additional almost $198 billion, to be uh, uh, stated correctly, uh, in uh, the uh, Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund that has not yet been allocated to Medicaid providers, of which we are a large one. Again, NAC with 15 other organizations have signed a strong letter, which has gone from the chairman of all the House, Democrat and Republican House and Senate uh, to the secretary, saying it's time to get the money out into the street and to the people doing the work. Please know that we are working very aggressively uh, to get uh, that amount of money, a good portion of which will go to community health centers, as well as passage of the House legislation that was passed with the 7.6. Let me say that still leaves us about $70 billion or close enough to it that we'll be fighting for to have included this year uh, to include the five-year reauthorization, additional uh, funding for the infrastructure and workforce-related programs, which gets into including dental uh, and, and what you're talking about today. Uh, so NAC will continue with everything it has to be fighting uh, uh, full-fledged for that. And I feel more energized than ever, and I hope it speaks for all of us, especially when we move from the situation, again, that happened uh, over the last week and has been happening for some time, how we deal with those minorities that are most heavily affected in the nation. One area we can help a lot is by improving the health care, creating jobs, and building the infrastructure in those communities. With that, Rachel, I thank you and thank all of you for your support. And you're going to be with us. We're going to need a lot of grassroots effort uh, to finalize and to get this achieved. Please stay with us on it, and we are winning. Thank you so much, Tom and Claudia. Your leadership along with that of NAC's board chair, Lathrin Woodard, will get us through these very exceptionally challenging times. Your messages are right on. They're a reminder that we all have a role to play in this world, a responsibility to make it a better place. Through all of this, we must continue our unwavering efforts to fulfill the mission of the health center movement, health equity for all. As we begin the program, let's get some housekeeping items out of the way. If you're having any technical difficulties, click on the Request Support button at the bottom of the screen. For those joining via Internet, some of today's speakers have content slides. The recording, transcript, and the slides will be posted on NAC's website after the webinar. If you have a question during the panelists' presentations or during the formal Q&A at the end, please enter it in the Q&A with the speakers area and include whom you are directing your question. We will try to group the questions around topics or themes to make our Q&A time more efficient. Questions that we are not able to get to will be added to NAC's website in the COVID-19 page. If you wish to chat with other participants, and I see some are now, um, or communicate with the NAC staff during the call, please use the chat feature. And lastly, and, more, and just as important, we would like to hear your ideas about other future topics. If you have any of those to recommend, please also enter them into the chat feature. Let's get started today. Since March, NAC has hosted the Flattening the Curve webinar series to provide the latest updates from national and federal partners, as well as insights into what health centers were experiencing as they weathered the COVID crisis. Today, while the crisis continues, health centers are working on reopening their doors. But we must acknowledge two things. First of all, we know health centers never really closed. Their flexibility and innovation enabled them to continue providing care in a modified way. Second, the phrase reopening the doors means different things to different health centers. Varying factors impact each health center's efforts to reopen. For example, the status of their workforce, meaning do they have enough staff to proceed but also how about the staff's well-being. It also includes the health center's financial viability and assuring the safety of staff and patients in facilities. And of course, their ability to obtain and maintain an adequate supply of tests, PPE, and all of the other supplies needed to operate. While it remains critical for health centers to continue their focus on appropriately responding to the COVID pandemic, 
it is just as imperative that we look to the future. It is clear there is no going back to yesterday's normal. This pandemic catapulted the healthcare system and especially health centers into the future. And health centers are now at a crossroads. Do we maintain the status quo or do we evolve and innovate to continue leading in the delivery of primary health care? This is our opportunity. That flexibility, brilliant innovation, and transformation health centers are using to battle COVID-19 has opened the doors in so many ways for health centers to reimagine health care. Let's look at those innovative approaches as viable, efficient, and effective healthcare delivery models to shape the future of America's health centers. With that in mind, NAC is excited to introduce a new webinar series entitled Reimagining Care. This five-part summer series will provide examples of promising practices and get into the nuts and bolts of operational practices all the while building on the innovations necessitated by COVID-19. Today's webinar is focused on reopening dental practices and Dr. Donald Weaver will be moderating, moderating the panel. Dr. Weaver is a NAC senior, vice, senior advisor for clinical workforce and has had an esteemed career with the Public Health Service and HRSA. He is an expert and a resource in all things oral health in health centers. Dr. Weaver, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, and on behalf of all of us, for all of you out there on the front lines, we want you to know we're daily in awe of what you are doing with care and showing your compassion uh, to improve the health in your communities during this pandemic. Uh, thank you seems like not enough to say, but we want you to know how much you're very much appreciated out there. Uh, Rachel, with health equity and social justice as cornerstones of our health center movement, now is the perfect time to reimagine. Imagine again, rethink, in order to change or improve ways to achieve optimal health for all. Uh, as Rachel mentioned, we will have some time uh, at the end of this presentation to answer some of the questions and ways to get those answers uh, after the, uh, the webinar if time does not permit answering all of the questions, which we anticipate it won't. We want to acknowledge a group of partners who have a variety of resources, which you may find helpful. Uh, some of them are obvious, uh, our federal partners, HRSA, both the Bureau of Primary Health Care and the Bureau of Health Workforce, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I want to add one here, and although I know this session is on reopening dental practices, please take advantage of the resources available through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the, the mental health and behavioral health implications of, of both the, the pandemic and the tragic situation that we're in in this nation right now in addressing racism. Uh, are, is going to be high, and we need to take advantage of all those resources. Our cooperative agreement partner, the National Network for Oral Health Ex Access, the DentaQuest Partnership uh, for Oral Health Advancement, the Oral Health Progress and Equity Network, uh, state dental directors, and primary care associations, health center controlled networks, and what we're going to hear from now, health centers from across the country. I hope the message is loud and clear. We're learning from and here for each other as we reimagine. No one has all of the answers, but when we can share, uh, we can learn a lot from each other, and most importantly, the beneficiaries are the populations and people that we're privileged to serve. Since you have bios in the slide deck, uh, I will be introducing people with one-liner so we can maximize the time that they have to present to you and get to your questions. And our first presenter is Isaac Zekel. Uh, I, I knew I'd say that wrong, Isaac. It's Isaac uh, Zeckel, Chief Dental Officer at HealthLink in Indiana. So, Isaac, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Weaver, for that introduction. And uh, thanks to NAC for uh, having me uh, available to share HealthLink's journey to reopening uh, our dental practices. Uh, next slide, please. And again, next slide. One more. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to, uh, I'm represent HealthLink. Uh, we are um, uh, a health center in Northwest Indiana. We uh, had the privilege to serve 40,000 patients last year across 15 sites. Uh, five of the sites um, provide dental services. Um, and we have a diverse uh, demographic that we serve. Next slide, please. 
And as many of you um, have also experienced, um, our, our journey through this, through this time of uh, much uncertainty started very quickly and um, resumed very quickly. Um, I'm sharing with you a graph of basic the encounters that my dental providers were uh, achieving and the precipitous decline in April. Um, and so, like many dental programs, we were able to repurpose our staff to support our medical colleagues um, while we're still able to do our part in keeping uh, the emergency rooms free of um, dental emergencies. Um, this time uh, separated many of our staff that were used to working very closely together, um, which allowed us an opportunity to implement a new system of staying connected in a very uncertain and um, rapidly changing time. Next slide, please. <coughs> So we, we took this opportunity uh, where we had time to innovate um, a new system of staying connected. And that system of staying connected um, is part of a Microsoft Office or Microsoft 365. Uh, and Teams is a communication and collaboration platform. Um, and we use this to change the way that we um, were able to stay connected. Before, many of my programmatic changes involved telephonic meetings, many emails, policies and procedures for which I've shared with, uh, with you all for today, one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching. And then um, one of the most um, difficult to fix is the inter-office communication where um, much of the siloing at our sites would occur. Uh, so teams really radically changed that. I could um, record my team meetings, record for people that weren't able to be around, um, either were off taking care of loved ones or were um, unable to be there at that, on that day. I was able to collaborate with work groups um, to work on projects that we would have not been able to do unless we were in person. And email became much smaller part of my communication with my team. F finally, uh, many surveys I could check to make sure that um, my staff understood what I was trying to communicate with, um, with surveys and quizzes, and so I would have records of any ambiguity that may be, uh, may be surrounding that, um, those, those tasks and things that I'm asking them to do. Uh, because this, this, this um, communication tool allowed me to uh, uh, instantaneously connect with my with my staff. And it really, this tool helped me now during this time um, overcome the three main challenges in restarting our dental services. Next slide, please. And I'd, I'd like to talk with you about the first main challenge um, and things that we've learned along the way as we've restarted our practice. Um, the staff really are unfamiliar with all the new PPE requirements and all the additional infection control pro, uh, protocols. Um, the, many of the staff have never worn N95 masks, they've never worn uh, face shields, and many of these things um, before are, are new to learn. The, the N95s, you have to keep in mind that not all N95s fit people the same. And what we found was when we first fit tested everybody, uh, people were, uh, you know, satisfied. But as they've started to um, use the, you know, started restarted services, they're finding that it interferes with their glasses. Um, it may not fit as well as they had thought. Or even our supply lines um, have uncertainty if you're going to be able to receive the same mask. So that's a really important part to keep track of if I was restarting my program again, making sure we knew which staff had a mask that fit and was um, so we could deliver that to them in a timely manner to make sure they're protected. Um, in addition, the staff really are, have, are, will have trouble getting used to all this. It's very uncomfortable. It's very difficult to breathe. It's, extru it's, it's much hotter than it was before. Um, so these are all things that um, when you restart, you have to take in consideration, both environmentally and with the schedule. Um, so if, 
if I were going to give some pointers, um, I would suggest identifying a suitable area for putting on and taking off the PPE. That's an area um, kind of in, set aside where you can store the PPE, you can have your sanitizers, your uh, alcohol, san uh, alcohol hand sanitizer, um, mask, gloves, the whole nine yards set up here. And this, that's what that image um, depicts. And then you really, the staff really need to practice a lot. This is, it's foreign, and um, the more they practice with each other, they, the better they'll get at it. Um, and then f furthermore, I re required that all my staff demonstrated um, over video conference with me directly to verify that it's fitting correctly, that they're able to put it on and take it off without uh, contaminating each other. Um, and so I was able to keep help, I was able to achieve that with utilizing Teams. And then finally, we want to minimize the movement of staff and materials from the clinical area to the non-clinical area. We want to keep everything separated. And we, we wrote policies and procedures for that, as well as uh, putting up simple signs that say stop. So next slide, please. And as the staff get used to um, get used to wearing all this additional uh, protective equipment, there's going to be a time frame where they have to get you know where it's it's going to take some time. They won't be as efficient as they were before. So um, and they may make they may have some slip ups. So the way we tackled the schedule in a way that I thought worked well is we created a framework for the procedures um, that stratified the procedures in uh, higher aerosol or higher risk um, and, ha and as well as a priority. So the, a dental work group stratified all the procedures into these categories, which helped us kind of set the stage for what we we're going to do when. Next slide, please. And so this is a representation of what I've been talking with my staff, sharing with my staff, um, and it allowed us to kind of slowly ramp up as the staff are getting more used to everything, the me all the changes that are actually constantly occurring, uh, the recommend, you know, the CDC's updating its recommendations every day. Um, we're running into various staff concerns that we're addressing. So this kind of um, ability to provide priority services that have a lower risk at the beginning was, will really help uh, reduce the risk. Next slide, please. And so, you know, as, as, we, started re, as we restarted services, um, it's, it's very apparent that we could not maintain 8% of our productivity like we experienced in April. Um, so we sat down with our, uh, the CFO to set goals with the staff, and we were very honest and open about what, what it's going to take to return us to financial s sustainability. And so I was very transparent in talking with the staff and say, okay, this is our goal. In, in June, we have to get to 50%. In July, we have to get to 80%. And if we can work together, let, I think we, you know, we can get there. Um, and staff are just one component. We really have to reassure the patients. The patients are n nervous about coming back into the office. That um, we were able to um, create a, a video that the link is below, but basically it shows the patients what they're going to expect when they come in. There's going to be a lot of questioning. They're going to get your temperature taken. Uh, there's not going to be magazines in the waiting room. So it kind of it helps. Um, Bring, helps bring the anxiety level down with the patients so understand where they're gonna, what's going to be happening and where they're gonna, uh, what might look different when they come in. And then you're not ever going to get anywhere without the staff on board. Um, so like I've mentioned previously is working with the, staying in touch with the staff and I, our communication tools made that much easier, uh, especially since um, everybody's been um, relegated to different parts of the, of the state <laughs> during this time. Um, 
in, in addressing their concerns and doing everything you can to um, rectify problems that may come up. And then once you get everybody on board, you've, you've, you've addressed the concerns, it's going to be a constant cycle of modifying the templates and being very specific about what procedures are going to be done when, how much time are we going to be allowed to disinfect, how, how, how is it all going to work. So being the more specific you can be with developing your templates and workflows, the better. And then keep the staff informed about you know, what the successes are. Uh, how are we progressing towards the 50 and 80% goal that we've um, outlined, be outlined? So that's, that's it's one, if one of these components falls, falls down, well, we, won't, we will struggle to maintain financial sustainability. So next slide, please. And finally, um, you know, looking ahead, we've invested very heavily in uh, teams and that platform of communication with our staff. And um, just because we're starting to reopen our dental offices, doesn't mean we're going to let that fall by the wayside. It just was such an effective way of staying in touch with everybody. And I, um, part of working in a collaborative practice with our medical, com medical partners, our pharmacists, our um, podiatrists, optometrists, is, is being able to communicate with each other. And I believe uh, this platform helps us achieve that. And some of the ideas that we are looking into is um, Getting, getting our patients vaccinated in the dental operatory um, where the, the dental staff would message the medical assistant uh, electronically and say, you know, we need a vaccine. Uh, the dentist would talk with the parent about getting HPV. The medical assistant would come down and immunize the patient in the dental chair the same day. How convenient could that be? Um, and that, would, that could work for flu or even COVID-19 when that, uh, that vaccine uh, comes one day, hopefully sooner than later. Um, and then, you know, have, working with the warm handoffs between the medical and the dental, um, you know, well child checks, pregnant women, uh, high-risk diabetics, those are all um, opportunities that this communication platform um, we're looking to invest in. So um, with that, I... We'll turn it back over to Dr. Weaver, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Isaac, thank you so much. We're going to take ourselves across the country to Washington and Oregon, and Steve Davis, who's the Chief Dental Officer at Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic. Steve, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Dr. Weaver. Um, also, thanks to NAC for reaching out to me. Um, uh, Dr. Zuckel gave a great presentation. I think you're going to see a little bit of kind of overlap, which is, which is telling that, you know, I think we're all in kind of the same situation um, nationwide as we're looking at these things and, and moving forward. So, um, so next slide, please. Great. Um, yeah, so a little bit about the Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic. Um, I'm going to call them farm workers from here on out because it is kind of wordy to go through the whole thing. Um, so we are in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I think when most of us at least I'm, I'm from the, uh, the Midwest. When I thought of the Pacific Northwest before I moved out here, I thought of Seattle. But um, a little geography lesson about this area of the United States is that there is a big mountain range called the Cascades. It goes right through Washington and portion of Oregon. And, and what it does, it divides the state into a couple of different climates. And so where we are on the east side of the state is a high plains desert. And so fortunately, we have a large river called the Columbia that runs through our portion of the state and allows us to water all of our land. And so we have rich volcanic soil here and it's a great place to grow things, as you know, apples, um, other produce and um, hops, which are great too for, for beer making throughout the United States. So um, a little bit about the farm workers. Um, we do have 24 medical locations. We have 14 dental locations, um, pretty big staff, 33 dentists, um, 13 dental residents. We run both an AGD and a pediatric residency. Um, we're up to 149 operatories right now. We have mobile units. Um, Dental Specific has about 55,000 unique unique patients. And um, the year before last, we saw 141,000 visits. Um, System-wide, um, we have about 166,000 active patients. And usually, we do over 700,000 visits a year. Um, our population is mostly Hispanic, about 65%. Um, and more than 40% of our patients speak something other than English. So. All right, let me go ahead, next slide, please. Great. 
Great, thank you. Um, I, I think this will be familiar to a lot of us, um, and I want to kind of kind of progress through um, things that happen as as we started to to see the the COVID epidemic kind of take take foothold. And so, um, initially, we were just doing some screening for traveling out of the country, and as I think we all know, that rapidly changed into screening for multiple different questions. And as we've progressed through the last few months, those those questions have have doubled in size, and so. Um, currently, we're doing this in, in, in all of our sites. We're just screening all entrances for patients. We're screening over the phone. Um, we're screening um, during, our, during our virtual visits. Um, we're also screening staff and, and asking them that, that they test uh, that they're asymptomatic for the day. day. So um, early on, we, we made sure that we put in some clear barriers for our direct front facing staff. Um, came up with a policy to talk about universal masking for all staff, um, keeping in mind that we needed to, to monitor our PPE. Um, and then we really had to um, move rapidly, both in medical and dental, um, to provide a way to have, give access to our patients, um, since there were there was kind of an inability for them to come in, in person. And so, um, on the sixth of uh, April, we started doing dental dentistry in Washington, and on April tenth, we did that in Oregon. And so, um, off to the the right, you'll see there is I, I have a very active IS department and some team members that worked on creating. Um, new smart phrases are kind of basically text notes that are embedded in our, in our Epic software. So we use something called wisdom. So, um, and then we roll that out and um, to all the clinics um, and we're still utilizing, utilizing them even as we go into these kind of next phases of reopening. So um, throughout the last few months, we've remained open for emergencies. Um, we are always open for community emergencies. Um, we definitely were open for uh, our patients of record. Um, and actually we continue to do our, D, our GA services for pediatrics. Um, we recognized that there was going to be um, a significant risk if we allowed those patients to, to wait until after the epidemic kind of started to settle down. Um, and so we actually boosted those services and provided more access. It's actually helped us get through some of a backlog that we had. Um, within our um, Epic EDR, we created a work queue um, that would help track those more at-risk patients um, throughout the time. And, and now that we're getting closer to resuming um, more services, we're utilizing those uh, work used to get back in those patients uh, specifically um, since they are, have more pressing needs. So, And then to get you, give you an idea about the impact that we've had over the last few months, um, you know, typically we see about 10,000 dental visits every month, a little bit more, uh, various throughout the year. Um, throughout the last two months, we've been closer to that thousand mark. And so, um, but I will say kind of proudly that, you know, almost 20% of those visits were, were teledentry visits. And so it's been a, able to get us um, some access to patients, kind of screen them before they, they physically showed up at the clinic and assess their needs without having to kind of, um, you know, either put staff or the, the, the patient at risk themselves. So, uh, next slide. Can you all hear me? Am I not speaking up loud enough? I'll, I'll try and get closer to my microphone. I apologize. So let's talk about phase one um, because we are straddling two different states. Um, these things happened at, at different times. Um, and so in Oregon on um, the 4th, um, we were allowed to reopen to really elective care. Um, and on the 18th up here in Washington, um, we could do the same as well. So um, when we did the opening, we, we maintained our screening. Um, we, we also had um, repurposed our mobile units at a number of our sites to allow um, outside COVID testing. Um, and so when patients presented at the door and they were potentially symptomatic, we'd actually kind of move them through that, that, that line and get them COVID tested. So um, our recommendation for this first kind of phase of reopening was that we, we would exclude our at-risk patients, which means anybody 65 and over, over um, or those that were uh, CDC or uh, ADA kind of um, at-risk patients. Um, we continue to utilize teledentry to manage their needs, um, but they could be brought in if it was necessary. So. Um, the other thing we really emphasize, and I think that you'll see this elsewhere in some other guidelines, is that we want to reduce the number of um, non-patients coming in with, with, um, with, uh, with uh, patients that are coming into actual clinical care. And so um, try and reduce the number of parents to one, um, you know, no siblings. Um, and then when everyone is entering the, the building, we would ask them to either mask up. And when we call them um, ahead of time, we would ask them to be masked with them. And uh, we make sure that they're masked up when they're in our facility. Um, one thing I didn't mention before is that during the, the turndown, we actually had decided to rotate our dental staff on um, kind of half on, half on, and two-week rotations, um, first to kind of keep them safe, um, 
you know, um, and reduce our exposure, and then also kind of manage the fact that we, we had uh, a reduced uh, demand for, for patient care. And so um, we also reduced the, the physical staffing level, which is the DA systems that we're working them to a smaller thing. And then repurpose a lot of the staff members um, to work on the front lines with screening outside, um, helping with our, our mobile unit screening, um, and utilizing them wherever we could. So um, as you can imagine, because we had a relatively large dental staff, there, we did have to put some um, employees on a temporary leave, um, include our hygienists, but I'm hoping to get them back here within, within a week or so. So um, to get the, back to the first phase there, um, no hygiene visits for that, um, which is um, to be expected. Um, um, we, we're we're going to bring providers back, back based on the demand, um, which we are seeing slowly increase over time here. Um, and you really think about doing like half schedules. And so one thing that a half schedule does is allows us to create some extra physical space between um, patients because we can utilize every other chair. Um, waiting rooms, we reduce the number of chairs out there, then we, we move everything six feet apart. Um, and at this point, we're actually seeing that almost any procedure can be scheduled, um, no implants. Um, we definitely wanted to focus on our phase one at, at child recalls and taking care of that population and their restored needs. Um, and then getting through some of um, kind of our, our patients that were, were more symptomatic. And so, you know, the, those patients that were, were waiting to have an endo, endo completed or, you know, needed a denture delivered because they were, they were having problems eating. So um, the one thing we also did in this phase one, which was a little bit um, unique, is that we had asked for all patients that were coming back for aerosolizing procedures to actually have a COVID test um, before their visit. So um, we would actually have the dentist put in an order um, for the COVID test, and then those patients would be moved through our external um, mobile units or other sites outside. Um, they'd have the COVID test done, and then um, within three days, it would end up in our um, EPIC record. Um, we'd contact those patients and um, kind of verify that with them and then get them back for service. So um, there was a pretty significant amount of workflow that had to be developed behind the scenes around that. Um, so I'm happy that that is in place. Um, it's not without hiccups, though. Um, because there have been issues where sometimes those tests take more than three days to come back. And so um, I, I think as we move forward into the, the next phase, which is phase two, um, hopefully as we kind of change some of those requirements, it'll give us a little more flexibility. Next slide, please. And so phase two. And so um, really all I want to do here is highlight the changes and then also kind of mention that chart I have on the lower lower right hand side because that does, does kind of direct some of our stuff. And so, so phase two, which is where we are now and started this week is that we are gonna go ahead and return back in our hygiene visits. Um, but at this point we're asking for only hand scaling and we're not gonna be using the Cavitron. So we also wanna emphasize two of these. We wanna limit the amount of spider that's happening is that we, you know, for, for kid visits, we're gonna be doing a toothbrush profi, um, not unless you're using a um, profi angle, so. Um, we do have hygienists that work within our pediatric practices and they're going to come back and do um, expanded duty with those, those, those dentists. And so, um, and then really getting back to a, a normal staffing level for one provider, but continue the rotation in and out of our clinics um, as we see um, demand increase. And so, um, and then really we did not put restric restrictions on procedures um, as long as they're maintaining kind of a reasonable volume level um, of patients coming into practice. Um, and then one thing we did this last week is we actually um, removed the requirement that we have a, a COVID test for every patient coming back from an aerosolizing procedure. So um, given that, though, um, I think that the previous plan, which was to do the testing, did help mitigate some risk because, uh, you know, I found out last week that we had six positive patients that were asymptomatic that had had that COVID screening and just told me that, what you know, what we're still facing in our community isn't always completely apparent. apparent. So... You know, and then and this is kind of giving you an idea of what we're seeing here in Washington and, and Oregon as well, too, is that, you know, on 430, we had 558 positive patients. Um, by 526, we had 1,200 positive patients um, in, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our kind of population. So, and that continues to rise. And so when we have looked at reopening our practices because they're in such diverse, different environments, um, we've had to approach every practice a little bit uniquely. And so we still have one clinic here in Toppenish, um, which remains... Um, only open for emergency treatment because of the high level of patients that are um, testing COVID positive in this population. So, next slide. Great, thank you. Um, and I think that everybody's familiar with, with kind of the PP guidance that's, that's come down through the, through the CDC. Um, I just wanted to kind of give this as a reference um, for those of you um, 
that, that you know, maybe are not kind of as well versed with this. I think that the dental providers have seen a lot of this and we've learned a lot about PP over time here. So um, I'm really fortunate to have a really robust quality department that works with me um, that helps me kind of keep, um, keep ahead of the CDCI guidelines and OSHA guidelines and make sure that we're doing things that are appropriate to protect our staff and to protect our patients. Um, and I think the one thing that we've really focused on too is, is, is keeping an eye on our PPE. And so um, about a month and a half ago, um, we created the burn rate calculator to see what our burn rate would be for our PPE usage um, as we go through this. And it, it helped us kind of monitor what um, PPE we have left on, on hand. And there's many reasons for that, which, but, but you know, specifically we want to make sure that we have adequate PPE in case we need to revert back um, to um, previous you know, our plans in case there's a, an outbreak. And so, and both Oregon and Washington require that we have at least a two week emergency supply of PPE on hand. So, um, and I know there's a lot of questions around N95 reuses. Um, you know, uh, I kind of put a little blood there from the CDC. There, there's some good recommendations from there. Um, it's unfortunate we're that, in, that we're in that situation. We have to, cons- you know, worry about um, our supplies of N95s, but um, I think manage them appropriately, we should still be able to provide an adequate level of patient care. Um, next slide, please. And then kind of current next steps. And so right now, um, we're really interested in looking at that, um, kind of the next step of our facilities. And so, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about um, closed operatories versus open operatories. Um, we don't have the luxury of having all closed operatories because of the way that our, our, our clinic's already built. Um, but we do have a number of closed operatories, and so we're, we're, we're putting in dedicated exhaust fans to, to convert them into kind of pseudo-negative pressure rooms um, for those longer procedures that will be highly aerosolizing. So um, we've also been looking at our internal um, HVAC system and, and how we can increase the MERV rating of our filters. Um, and so, you know, it, there's a lot of discussion around that, too, and what level is correct. So we need to find the right balance between filtering and also allowing um, airflow to go through those units. And so... Um, we're continuing to monitor that with our facilities department. So um, our quality department actually has just recently purchased, um, uh, it's called an RH N95 mass decontamination unit. So it's specifically for decontaminating N95s. And so um, that will hopefully show up today. Um, and we're going to do some internal testing on that to, uh, to make sure that it actually is working. Um, we will not be having providers um, reuse others' masks. Um, we will mark each provider's mask and they will have their own mask back um, after it has been sterilized. So. Um, next phase, um, which we are probably going to look at in about two weeks, would be um, returning the dentist to a more normal staffing level. Um, and then also talking about how we want to use point of care testing. So um, we do have um, Sophia's Kaidel's um, kind of ability to do the, the same day testing. So currently we're worried about the number of um, tests we'll actually have available for that same day testing. And so we're gonna utilize those mostly for patients that really need to be seen that day um, for emergencies. Um, and then also just to, to, to potentially screen patients that are testing symptomatic, um, uh, especially on the medical side, um, but wanna go back to work. And so we can kind of verify that, you know, you are positive, you should, you should be, be avoiding work, so. And a couple of things I didn't put on this slide. Um, one project we had started before um, the COVID epidemic um, happened was to embed um, dental hygienists on our medical side um, and, and kind of have them provide care there too. Um, but what we found out you know, early on is that there were some issues with reimbursements. We actually moved them into our, into our WIC department. And so um, that is kind of, kind of a blessing for us because I think moving forward, um, having them on our WIC department will probably reduce a little bit of the burden of those WIC patients coming over the medical and we can, we can kind of um, distribute the amount of patients that are, are, are being seen throughout the system and, and provide care that way. Um, and I think that's about it. Um, next slide. Great. So left a few little resources there. And then um, just to show you, you know, how different dentistry is than it, it was, you know, three months ago, um, the level of PP that we're now, you know, having, having providers wear. So um, there is some adjustment to, to happen. And so um, I, I think that, you know, I, as a dental community, our interest is in, in maintaining the safety of our, our staff, um, also maintaining the safety of our patients as they come through our system. Um, and so I think as we move forward, we're going to get a better understanding of, you know, what are the risks out there? How do we mitigate those risks? Um, and hopefully get some more real world, world data to, to back those, uh, those steps up that we're taking. So with that, 
um, we'll move on. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. And I'm going to bring us back to the East Coast now with uh, Michelle Chambliss, the director of the Federal Tort Claims Act Division at HRSA. Michelle? Michelle, you might need to take yourself off mute. Michelle? Don, maybe we could start with a couple of the questions while we get Michelle back on. I was wondering the same thing, uh, uh, Rachel. So um, while we wait for Michelle, uh, I introduce you to my uh, NAC colleague, Phil uh, Stringfield. Uh, Phil, do you have a question for the group while we're waiting uh, to reconnect with Michelle? Awesome. Thanks so much, Don. Uh, and thank you uh, to both presenters for sharing some of that insight. Uh, we definitely got a lot of questions from the field, uh, but want to go ahead and center it around. Um, and this question can go for both presenters. I mean, center around your operatory. So uh, one of the questions were, do you have an open plan dental operatory? If so, what facility modifications have you made for greater infection control? Um, and then in addition to that, so how long do you wait for the aerosol to settle before bringing in the next patient? So a couple of workflow questions there as well. Hello. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? We, we can hear you now, Michelle. And, and if we could um, have you present, and then, uh, Phil, we may ask you to repeat that question after we finish with Michelle. So, Michelle, fire ahead. Okay, thank you, Don, um, for the introduction, and thank you for NAC for inviting me. Good morning and good afternoon. As individual states begin to resume dental care, we have heard that health centers are concerned that there is a risk to their FTCA coverage and coverage of their providers given potential differences between states, federal and professional association guidelines on reopening dental practices. So I put together some practical guidance as it relates to FTCA coverage that I want health centers to consider as we take this journey together and as you reopen your dental practices. First and foremost, whatever you are planning to implement going forward, the health center must base decisions on its ability to provide a safe and secure environment for both patients and staff. This is going to be a new reality for us, and we're going to have to reimagine how health centers are delivering care going forward. In order to reduce the risk of professional liability allegations regarding a breach of standard of care, health centers must carefully review state, local government regulations and guidance as well as federal agencies and state dental association, public health department, and dental board recommendations prior to making determinations regarding reopening and the operations of your practice going forward. I know this can be challenging, um, very challenging times without having a universal plan that all the nation follows. But health centers need to assess whether the care that they are providing meets the standard of care for their dental care at the health center. Please note that providers get their license from the state and you don't want to jeopardize their licenses. So they do need to adhere to the rules that govern their license as well. Documentation, documentation is key. When in doubt, document. People will always ask me, Michelle, what do we document? You will document that there is a pandemic. We are operating under whatever the guideline is and why. So you want to articulate what the state of affairs is at that time that led you to that decision. You want to also, I would recommend that you put it in a master file that the health center can quickly um, submit if any litigation arises in three, four, five years down, down the line. You want to also revise your policies and procedures as well as make sure 
<clears throat> excuse me, make sure that your staff are aware of these revisions and that you're putting them in place. If you're ever audited, you want to make sure that your policies and procedures um, that govern your staff are um, the reality of what you're going through. We got a lot of questions about do we create specialized COVID-19 forms. I really don't advise using a separate COVID-19 form. Instead, you should be obtaining basic consent for specific treatment as you ordinarily would. You, you may want to expand on the current language to include risks um, related to the public health emergency as, as COVID-19 that we're um, experiencing today. That also will cover you from if we do encounter public health emergencies in the future, um, you have that language and you don't, do not have to keep revising it. It will stand um, on its merit. Remember, an informed consent form by itself is insufficient to shield a medical provider from liability in creating, specific, in creating one specific to COVID-19. Um, may provide a dentist with a false um, sense of security. Rather, an informed consent form is designed to be part of a process of obtaining patients' agreement following the explanation and discussion of why the treatment is needed as well as the risk of an alternative to a procedure. When it comes down to telehealth, including teledentistry, this is an eligible um, practice for FTCA coverage when services are within the health center's scope of project. At this particular time, we've gotten a lot of questions on will there be a sunset clause related to this. Right now, um, we'll operate in the here and the now. Remember what I said in the beginning of my, of my talk that we're going to have to reimagine how this health care is delivered. Um, and uh, we will let you know if um, that provision is no longer in effect. But right now, it is status quo and continue with your efforts. Health centers and providers are encouraged to consult with private counsel and consider the purchase of private malpractice insurance when undertaking activities that may not fall within the health center's scope of project. Remember, when we talk about volunteers, which is um, something that came under the Cures Act, we're talking about volunteer providers that are licensed, certified, and registered to provide clinical services. So remember, keep that in mind. And right now, um, you would have to put in uh, what we call a VHP, a volunteer health professional uh, application to make sure that that person is, that provider is covered. There's a lot of questions also out there about non-health center patients. At this particular time, we put a particularized determination out which does cover you for non-health center patients as long as you are within the scope of your H80 grant. As we continue to uh, evolve in this process, we will keep you informed of any program updates. Please go to our website for updated information. It's timely. As we get questions in, we do um, write frequently asked questions and put it posted on the website. So stay tuned for it there. And I have um, given, should be up, um, for your viewing, our Health Center Program Support Line, which you can get an individual from our program from 7 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Monday through Friday. Um, that is a link there as well as a telephone number. That is the best way to get quick um, responses to the questions that you have. So at this time, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Weaver, and I thank you for your interest in HRSA's FTCA program. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, in the interest of time and also knowing that a lot of people want to attend the Today Show, that's uh, Today with McCray, uh, Rachel, I'll let you wrap it up and remind people to please put your questions in the chat box or send to them through the uh, 
email uh, note that we have on on the slide. So, Rachel, back to you. Thank you so much. I do want to thank everybody for joining the call this uh, today, and we also want to give a special thanks to our spe- our speakers. A dear, dear thanks on my part to the NAC team for helping bring this program to fruition. It was awesome. Save the date for June 25, July 9th, July 23rd, and August the 6th for the rest of the series. And remember to stay safe because you are very important. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you.